Welcome to NFL Daily, where we call Aiden O'Connell AOC. But it's a little confusing. I'm Greg Rosenthal. I'm down in Costa Mesa at Raiders training camp. This is going to be a little different NFL Daily. I talked to Sean Reed of The Athletic about the Raiders deep dive. I'm, I'm a little optimistic about this Raiders team. If it wasn't for the quarterbacks, man, the quarterbacks struggled here on Tuesday. But uh, that's been the case throughout training camp. I think otherwise this roster kind of frisky including their defense, including Jack Jones, who I also spoke to. So you'll hear an interview with Jack Jones, which was a lot of fun. And we'll wrap up the show with some questions from y'all out of the mailbag for NFL Daily. But quickly, going to hit the news to start the show. Brandon Ayuk, I hit it on our last show, got permission to talk trade with the Patriots, with the Browns. They've agreed to trade terms, and now it's in Brandon Ayuk's court and I think the silence speaks volumes right now that the 49ers were maybe in a position where they thought look Brandon Ayuk doesn't necessarily want to go to either uh, of these teams but we'll have to wait and see no real updates on that as of yet Gerard Mayo the Patriots head coach said he's learned from his guy Bill Belichick not to talk about players on other rosters other than that just got some updates about who's playing in the preseason who's not Uh, we got Jarrett Stidham as the starter in Denver Uh, Gerard Mayo said he's going to play all four of his quarterbacks. So we get some Drake May. We get some Jacoby Brissett this weekend, which I'm very excited about. Jaden Daniels is going to get the start for Washington this weekend. And just selfishly, I uh, want as many good players as possible to play in the preseason this week because Nick Shook and I are going to wrap up all the games on our show that airs Monday morning. So more interesting players, the better this weekend. Texans are also going to play their start. Jordan Love is also going to play. Other than that, a couple of minor moves. Adrian Amos signs with the Jaguars, might end up being their starting safety. The Lions lose Emmanuel Mosley, who is a cornerback, was potentially going to be their starter at nickel. And that's a little tricky because they might have to move Brian Branch into that spot. Eventually, not what they wanted. Also, everyone's favorite kicker in America, Harrison Bucker, uh, became the highest paid kicker in the NFL, a great kicker. They would not win those Super Bowls without him, and I will leave it at that for Harrison Bucker. And for the news, let's get to Tashawn Reed and start talking some Raiders. All right, we are here to talk some Raiders with Tashawn Reed of The Athletic, one of the best beat writers out there, the best two-man combo uh, with Vic Tafer at The Athletic. Go check out their coverage. They do a great job. Uh, we were here watching this offense struggle. Was was that typical? <laughs> Is that yeah, typical of what you've seen down here? It's been a pretty constant thing throughout throughout training camp so far. I mean, and really since OTAs. Um, I mean, it's, it's been rough for the offense, particularly the quarterbacks. Obviously, this was a great defense last year. They were ninth in scoring, so they're going up against a tough unit. But you would like to see more flashes than they they've shown so far. I'm gonna I'm gonna start on the optimistic front, and then we'll get into the quarterbacks and the offensive struggles. And the optimistic case for them is that these lines to my eye, could be pretty good. I thought the offensive line was underrated last year. You you think differently after we talked ahead of time, so maybe yeah. I'm wrong. I don't trust <laughs> myself. And that the defense could be a top-10 group. And that the skill position players, if you really look at it, Devonta won. Jacoby's a good two. I liked what Trey Tucker did. Two really good young tight ends. Like, that's more than enough to win with. So usually Raiders fans are incredibly irrational, overly optimistic. They're always getting on me for doubting them. And usually I'm right the last 20 years. But this year, I can actually kind of see the irrational Raiders fans case. Are you, are you feeling that? Uh, I, I don't <laughs> feel exactly the same way. I do think there's, there is some good things to celebrate. I mean, like the defense, I think they're legit. Um, and, and there's always that question when you have one unit dominating the other in training camp is, or are they good or they're just going against a bad offense or vice versa? But I don't, I don't have any doubts about this defense. I mean, they were a top 10 unit last year. And really, after AP took over, you know, those last nine games of the season, they, they finished, I, I believe, first in scoring defense the rest of the way. I mean, we saw what they did to the Chiefs on Christmas Day. They went on and won the Super Bowl. And they brought back nine starters last year. And one of the starter changes was a massive upgrade, you know, getting Christian Wilkins, defensive mm-hmm. tackle from the Dolphins. And, uh, I mean, you know, Patrick Graham, this is his third year with the Raiders. And so he's really starting to, like, you know, starting to loosen up the playbook. And and, and I, I think AP referred to, like, rolling dice out there. He's just trying stuff, playing Russian mm. roulette. And so the defense is clicking. Um, and I, I think that'll translate even when they're not going against a struggling offense. Um, in terms of the offense, like, 
I think their offensive line last year struggled really mm. towards the beginning of the season. Like toward the end of the year, they they started to have more success running the ball and, and protecting the passer a little bit better. And so they did make some progress, but they needed to make upgrades. And I, I think they did that this off season. I mean, they they drafted Jackson Powers Johnson, a guard out of Oregon. Um, he's probably going to be a starter at left guard if he can be healthy. Healthy right now, he's on the pup list. You know, you got Colton Miller back. He's one of the a pretty solid left tackle, and the rest of the unit is coming together well, also. Um, and so, and as you said, I mean, there's no shortage of of talent on this team when it comes to weapons. I mean, Devontae Adams, arguably the best receiver in the league. Jacoby Myers is super underrated. Um, you know, two tight ends. You know, Brock Bowers. I know he's a rookie, but he he looks the part so far. Yeah, how, how has he looked? They saw him wi- lining up out wide on one play yeah. where the receivers were actually on the inside. That's cool. Yeah, I think some. 13 personnel where there's three mm-hmm. tight ends on the field. I think the third was Har- Harrison Bryant mm-hmm. probably. So like, yeah, how, how has Bowers looked? Yeah. I mean, he's a, he's sort of like a, I don't want to call him a jack of all trades cause he's really good, but they, they use him everywhere. I mean, they have him lined up, lined up in line as a traditional tight end. They have him split out wide as, a, as an outside receiver. They have him in the slot. You even see him in H back sometimes. Mm. We've seen him take jet sweeps. So, like they're using him all over the place and trying to maximize his skill set. It helps to have more of a traditional tight end like Michael Mayer, who can play in line. You know, he's a he's a bigger guy. He's about thirty pounds heavier. He's a better blocker, and so that frees them up to utilize Bowers in a lot of different ways. And even Harrison Bryant. I mean, he's he's been a solid third tight end for him. He's a, he's a really good blocker. He's lined up as fullback. They don't have a traditional one on the roster anymore. He's even made some some plays in the passing game as well. So I, he made a nice catch or two today. Yeah, that dude's yeah. a big. Man, those tight ends are crazy. Like. Yeah. So, I mean, this they have all the talent. And even Zamir White, you know, running back, um, you know, he's he's taken over for Josh Jacobs this year, and that's, those are big big shoes to fill. I mean, Josh Jacobs, he's been a star running back for years now, but he's looked pretty good. Um, the issue has just been their, their quarterback Okay, yeah, play. let's get to it. <laughs> so today was pretty rough. Mm-hmm. Aiden O'Connell especially, just not a lot of confidence with where he's going to go with the ball, to, to my eye. A lot of just pumping where you can just see he's not on time, where pump, pump goes and then throws a pick. I think he had he had a handful today. We're going to yeah. have Jack Jones on right after you. He, he had a couple of them. Yeah. And he, didn't, he did not look like he was comfortable in this Luke Getze offense. And that's one thing that gives me a little bit of pause. When I thought their offense looked capable enough down the stretch last year, but that was a different offensive scheme. It was an interim OC, Bo Hardegree. He's gone. Luke Getze comes here from the Bears. You mentioned changing it to kind of a zone scheme in terms of running, just a lot that's different. Like, t- tell me where those two guys are at, Minshew <laughs> and, and O'Connell, in this competition. Yeah, they're neck and neck, but not in a good way. Oh. You know, like, they've, they've both been struggling. Um, I think O'Connell, you know, he's more of the stationary pocket passer type of guy. Like, he doesn't have many athletic traits. Like, he's not going to be moving around, so he's going to stand back there and fire. And the timing isn't perfect and it's not on the money, then – he kind of freezes up when he has to improvise. He's not going to move around too much, um, you know, and, and so that, that leads to some of those anticipation throws where he, Jack Jones, it was a three-on-three drill, I believe, and it was a slant route, and he telegraphed it the whole way, and Jack just jumps in front of it and picks it. And so, But even that he, one was late. Like, he yeah. could have thrown it earlier, yeah. and he kind of he kind of yeah. pumped it. But you can kind of see he's almost, like, determining what he's going to do before he does it. And, like, that works sometimes, and you need an element of that in a timing-based offense. You know, with, with Luke Getze, I mean, he has some of those those Shanahan elements, um, you know, coaching under the floor. But that can't be what you do all the time. And Gardner Minshew, he offers more of that escapability outside of the pocket. He's more of a gamer type but he takes it too far, you know, pretty often, and that leads to some other costly interceptions. I mean, he got picked off today towards the end of practice by safety Trayvon Merrick on one of those kinds of plays, and so he takes risks that a quarterback should take if you're, you know, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Brett Favre kind of talent. He doesn't have that type of talent, and so um, it's, it's been a struggle for him. I mean, it's, it's early in camp, so you don't want to overreact, but they still have a month to try to figure it out, but it hasn't been it hasn't been Right, they, so they keep saying the coaching staff they want someone to step up. Minshew – apparently was better at the scrimmage, which checks out. Like, no coach that's coached Gardner Minshew has ever really fallen in love with him off practice. They always yeah. kind of not want to play him. And then he gets in the game, and it's like, oh, okay. And yeah. he ends up outplaying the guys that are there. And so if I was a Raiders fan, I'd be a little disappointed. I personally, I went back and watched some O'Connell, and I thought, man, for a rookie, he, he did good things, and they're, the upside's bigger. I got to say, for my one day of uh, – scouting here just the arm I thought he maybe had plus arm strength and maybe I don't see that he has a bigger arm than Gardner Minshew but not not yeah. not even a plus arm so no he's his thing is more accuracy yeah um but but the issue has been like as I said when things kind of get off schedule a little bit and he has to create like and you have to move around and make throws on the run and maybe make throws that are a little bit more difficult that's what that's when it starts to break down for him and so for me Aiden like I, I don't I don't 
you know, I mean, he was a, a day three pick. Like, right. I mean, right. he's a he's a good backup, I think, in my mind, who can be a spot starter in a situation. If you get that out of a day three pick at a quarterback, like, that's a win. But they're asking him to be something that's much more than that, you mm. know, in, in terms of competing for a full-time starting job. You can't just be that type of guy. And so he may not ha- ultimately have that ceiling. I mean, he's going to be 26 years old this season, so he's only a second-year player. But, you know, I mean, it's not, it, that much it, older it's not like he's 21, you know what I mean? And so, right. We'll see. Like, again, we still have a month to go before the season, and so maybe he makes a vast improvement, or even Minshew, because Minshew hasn't, hasn't, you know, played lights out either. And to so. me, if it's close, though, I would not that uh, we could do this at the NFL. If it's in Vegas, like, to me, it's going to be Minshew week one if it's that close, because I think they'll just trust in the money that they gave him and the experience that he's had, at least showing he's a gamer and, and give him a chance. Uh, I wanted to get to you on how insane Max Crosby <laughs> appears to be. I mean, he is just talking during the whole practice, so fired up, getting after these right tackles to the point you almost feel a little bad for him. Just He's he's beating up on him. Yeah, he's a madman. I mean, he, he plays the same way you see him in games. I mean, he never comes off the field. It's constant effort. He's talking. I know he went viral a couple of years ago for his interaction with Patrick Mahomes and them going back and forth. That's how he is all the time. You know, like that's not an a- act that he turns on for game day, you know, day in and day out. I mean, he has off insane offseason regimen. I mean, he's in the facility pretty much every day, at like 6 a.m. He stays late. He's really diligent about his body. Um, and so he takes it as seriously as, as anyone that you'll see in the league. And that translates to practice. And you always feel bad for the right tackle. Last year was Jermaine Luminor, and he got it every day. This year it's Thayer Munford and, and rookie DJ Glaze. And so he doesn't hold back. And, and they view it, the Raiders, they don't try to pull him back because they view it as an iron sharpens iron type of situation where if you can come to hold your own against a Max Crosby, then when you're going against, you know, a so-so pass rusher, you'll be all right. But, you know, those early days at camp when he's really getting after you and he's beating you play after play and letting you hear about it, that can be demoralizing to a guy. And so, but I think you need that because, I mean, you're going to go against some tough pass rushers in this league. And if a guy can't hold up against, you know, some of the better ones, like you can't trust him as you're starting right tackle or left tackle, you know, depending on what side that next Crosby is on. And so if those guys can't stand the fire, then, you know, you need to make an upgrade at that position. They, they got a chance this year because the defensive line talent is excellent i think it's deeper than people realize malcolm Koontz is a good player the, the players inside are, are stepping up obviously wilkins and and pierce got those linebackers that's where i give him a lot of credit just playing at a level you you wouldn't have expected last year the secondary a bit of a question but but certainly some talent there and they're bigger th- they're better than the sum of their parts you saw and that happens with defense and energy i guess give us someone that you've seen Maybe on the defensive side in this camp that that stood out to you that surprised maybe some someone people don't know that much about. It's got to be Jacorian Bennett, um, okay. like you said, coming into camp um, with the with the defense. The question was really, is that secondary complete? I mean, we knew what the safeties could do with with Marcus Epps and Trayvon Merrick. I think they were one of the better safety tandems in the league last year. Jack Jones, once he got picked up, really came on strong. Nickelback Nate Hobbs, I think, is one of the better nickels in the league. But a big hole was, do they have another outside starting cornerback? And Jacorian Bennett. He was a rookie last year. He came in. He had a really strong camp, training camp, started the first four games of the season, but he really struggled, and he got hurt, and he lost lost his job and fell out of rotation. But training camp, he's been balling, man. What I mean, number is he? Number zero. Yeah, so number he had zero. a nice day, too. Yeah, yeah. So he's they been, all did, though. Yeah, I don't know been, what to think. The secondary's been leading the way, honestly. I think they've been the most impressive unit on defense because, mm. you know, when the pads aren't on, like, the you know, the, the trench play is kind of hard to fully evaluate that, but whether the pads are on or off, the secondary's been balling. But, like, on those days when the pads do come on, you see the defensive line start to dom- dominate and how they kind of feed off of one, in- one another. And, and I mean, that linebacker, Robert Spillane, I mean, he he came out of nowhere last season. I mean, not just in the run game, but he was really good in pass coverage. So, I mean, this defense to me, like it has all the makings of uh, potentially being a great one this year. I, I love uh, our Raiders fans that are listeners because I feel like we have a lot. and we- I feel like we haven't covered that that much over the years just because they've been so boring. And this yeah. is the one year I come <laughs> in thinking like, I don't know. I saw that over under is like six and a half or something. Yeah. I know they have a tough schedule. I think eleven of their first thirteen games are either in division or against playoff teams from a year ago. They start with a couple of road games, but those in division games, like now, maybe week one at Chargers doesn't look too bad if if Herbert's not a hundred percent. Broncos aren't great. I'm I'm definitely feeling over six and a half. I was feeling maybe a couple over that, but. Are, are you're not feeling it? We'll end uh, on no, that. No, no, no. I, I would put them above six and a half. Okay. I think that's kind of low. Like, that's pretty um, I, I, I think they're going to be somewhere around a five hundred caliber team. Okay. Um, I think the the pessimism just I mean it's it's a quarterback driven league. So if if you have, you know, an uncertain you gotta be situation, quiet. Aiden standing right over there. Yeah, well, actually, right there. You know, if you have uncertain situations, <laughs> then you know that 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 kind of makes people less optimistic about you. Um, but you know, I think with their defense, if they can get their rush, run game going. 
Um, if the, the offensive scheme change under Luke Getzey, if it ends up being a better fit. Um, you mentioned that they have weapons. Like, I think there's enough there um, for them to stay competitive and win some of those games maybe that people don't expect them to make. Like, do they do they ultimately make the playoffs? I don't know. Like, the AFC is tough. Like this. Yeah, is, I don't think so. I'm not going yeah. that far. But yeah. just to make it interesting, I mean, give yeah. us give us interesting. I think they'll be competitive. It's just be been so many years of trying to convince us, oh, yeah, the Dennis Allen Raiders are going to do it or the Gruden Raiders, like, had, a, like, a little moment. But yeah. uh, these fans are starving. I, I want to see it for them. So I'm on your side this year. Raiders fans. Appreciate you, Tashaun. Appreciate you having me. All right, I am here with Jack Jones, the Raiders quarterback, who, if he keeps up this pace from today's practice, is going to set the NFL record for interceptions this year and uh, kickoff returns. You, you're not all seriously. I'm half joking, or, or you're actually going to do that. <laughs> No, nah, yeah, that's that's the goal, you know, to go in there and do something that's never been done. Yeah, I picked the right day. Uh, a couple of the other writers we were watching this, they're like, oh, who are you going to have on? I was like, oh, Jack Jones is coming on. And then you get one pick. Uh, great anticipation on a Aiden O'Connell. was like a three-on-three drill. -three you get another pick later. You have a big return. You boot that return, actually. So far, it almost took out our guy, Drake, here <laughs> behind the camera. So I was like, this was the right day to have Jack Jones on. You've had a lot of days like that out here? Uh, yeah, every day, you know, the defense has been coming out, stepping up and, you know, playing hard. And I think that right there is going to lead to plays being made. Yeah, I um, I wonder when you look at your role in this defense, do you think you're, it's part of your job to take the ball away and score some points for this offense? Uh, definitely. You know, I can't be a guy giving up touchdowns, giving up a lot of passes, giving up yards. Uh, you know, that, that's not good coming from a DB, especially when you have a – a D line like we have, you know, it, plays have to be made. Yeah, where do you kind of see yourself? You, you've had an interesting career. Obviously, you start out in New England and really a great start to your career on the field. Some things don't work out there. Then you come to the Raiders and make a, a big time impact. And really, you're their best cornerback. I, I think the way you played last year and coming into this year as a number one cornerback. Where kind of where do you see yourself? Amongst all these league cornerbacks out there. Thank you. I appreciate that. But, uh, I mean, if you ask me, I, th I think I'm the best corner in the league. And I think every corner that's going out there stepping on that field should feel like that. You know, it, it's not – it's a thin line between arrogance and, and confidence, you know. So, you got to be confident when you're going out there. And if you're not confident, then, you you know, you're setting yourself up for failure. So, I, I believe I'm the best. So, does that thin line get in you in some trouble sometimes going against the same guys every day on offense? Uh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Were you guys getting in? There wasn't much uh, fights or anything, but how's, how's it been? It sounds like the defense has kind of been do dominating day after day against this offense. Are they getting upset? Uh, I mean, we're just trying to push the offense to be the best that they can be because we know if we if we go hard and, and don't give them any breaks, then you know that's going to make them better in the season. So we just try to go out there and, and compete and show them a real look. Yeah, we, we had you. I did a show uh, with my friend Mina Kimes on ESPN a couple weeks ago where we each had to pick an X factor for the Raiders, and separately, we actually both picked you, uh, just because the ceiling feels very high for you, and really for this defense. It was kind of representing this defense. Where do you guys kind of feel like you fit into the NFL, where the Raiders' defense is at? Uh, I believe we're a top five defense in the league, you know, and this upcoming season, we're going to show exactly why we're, I believe we're a top five, you know, defense in the league, but, you know, without a question, I think we top five. Yeah, it's crazy because you, you got here in the middle of last year and it was pretty close to when in Antonio Pierce got the job and that defense really took off. What was what was it like joining this culture? And like how was the difference in how this team operates, especially on the defensive side of the ball and, and like where you came from in New England? Uh, I just think uh, AP, AP, get the guys going. You know, he know how to bring the best out the players. He can get you, he can get, the fire, you know, from the players and have every player, player going out there with their head on fire, you know, just flying around, willing to give it all for the team. And I think if you don't have that as a as a player, have a coach to, to, that you really believe in, then it's going to be tough to go out there and give, a, give you all. So we have AP, and I, I give hats off to him. I'll give all the credit to him. Mm. Max also kind of get you guys going. Oh, I mean, definitely. He was getting me going just watching there today. Yeah, definitely. He Max is a guy that shows up every practice, Every play almost, you know, it, it's just undeniable. What was it like you had that Christmas game where you really shut down that Chiefs defense and that was a, a big-time moment 
for your team. And now you're back. It's your first full season with the Raiders, and you're looking up at those guys as the back-to-back defending champs, three three Super Bowls. What is it like going against that team and Mahomes and having that target for you guys to go after in this division? Uh, that's that's a good team right there. And we know every time we see Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, this is going to be a tough game. You know, if we don't come out there, you know, playing an assignment alignment, uh, assignment alignment game, then is it, we'll lose because that team, is, they're real disciplined, you know what I'm saying? And they have a great quarterback on their side, so we, we know the type of challenges we have when we when we face the Chiefs, so I, I think it's going to be a lot of, you know, a lot of click clack and a lot of talk and good game coming from the Raiders and the Chiefs. Yeah, because it, it had been a minute since the Raiders could, could shut down the Chiefs like that. How, how did you do that? Uh, once again, credit to AP and credit to the defense and the team, you know, uh, one thing I noticed when we was out there on Christmas Day was, uh, you know, sometimes some games we'll be like, defense would be like, dang, defense is back up. We want the offense to score. But that game, we didn't blink. You know, we we didn't question it. When when defense was up, everybody had their hat on ready to go and was ready to step on that field. All right. Uh, I want you to talk me through uh, one of my favorite plays from the 2023 season. I think you know where I'm going with this, that interception <laughs> that you had against the Chargers. <laughs> I'm probably not the first person to ask, but that to me is one of, it's an all-time like cornerback play, a play I think people are, are going to remember where, where you reached back and you you read the play. Kind of walk me through how that play took place for you last year. Um, it was film study for one, for two, uh, Coach PG, you know, Co- Coach Pat Graham, he he made the call to put me in position to make that play. Um, you know, we, we played cover two on that play and that allowed me to take that chance to make that play. If PG would call cover three or man to man, you know, I would have to stay back and, and do my technique. But PG put us in a great call to to be able to make that play. I seen some um, four by one. Okay, like I seen pre-snap. Four, yeah, yeah, I seen four by one pre-snap. That's what I was looking for. And after that, you know, PG, he just, I mean, after that, I made the play. I went up, made the play. PG put us in position. And I seen four by one. And I went and got it. Do you have a mo like when you're making a play like that? And that was on Thursday night football. I actually had my my son. That's the only game of the week I get to watch with him. Did you even have in that moment? I'm sure you're going crazy. Like, man, that's a play that's making eight year olds go crazy all o- <laughs> over the country. Nah, I, I didn't think that, but I I was in my head when it happened. I'm like, wow, one hand, like, <laughs> you know, because when I ran back there, I was I was going up with two hands, but I realized I was running past the ball, so I just kind of reached back with one. And, you know, plucked it out there. <laughs> That's awesome. But last thing for you, I saw you, you know, entered training camp that you had noticed a little bit where the national media was putting you, that you maybe saw some predictions out there where I think 6 and 11 was, was one that you mentioned. I, I guess what what's your opinion on on those predictions that, that have been out there that the Raiders, you know, not a lot of people have expect a lot out of the Raiders this year. Yeah, I don't know why they don't have faith in us when, you know, the season that we had last year with the coaches switch, middle of the season, um, quarter. I mean, I obvious, obviously wasn't here, but you know, quarterback switches, you know, throughout the season, and we had more wins than than six wins. So, for, and I think this year we're a better team. You know, we have a solid foundation. So for them to say we're gonna win six games, that's kind of like a slap in the face, you know. And you know, the team feels that, so we gonna mm. go out and show them. So that's something you guys talk about amongst yourself. Definitely. Okay, Jack Jones, uh, the cornerback for the Raiders. Looking forward to watching you this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. That was a lot of fun with Jack Jones. I'm easily swayed. I I come down here and the defense is so dominant and I'm convinced Aiden O'Connell is going to be trash this year and that this defense is going to be awesome. Man, O'Connell just did not look comfortable at all in this practice, but the playmakers are there and Jack Jones and and Max Crosby at the top of the list. We're going to wrap up this show down in Costa Mesa by going to the mailbag. You can ask us questions at NFL Daily Podcast at gmail.com. I, I want to hit another mailbag e- early next week, maybe later this week. NFL Daily Podcast at gmail.com. And yeah, while, while we're here, go, go to the YouTube page, subscribe, like, help us out. I, I loved all the encouraging emails that we were looking at between me and Randy. And yeah, Randy, we're now through five teams doing a deep dive on. I need that. I need that big board. We've hit five out of the 32. If we haven't hit you yet, we've hit Eagles, Raiders, Rams, Chargers, Bears. We are going to hit you at some point this season. It's going to take a while. All right, let's get to the questions. Let's start with Eldon, uh, who asks, how many starts for J.J. 
McCarthy this year. I'm putting the over under at 14. I, d- I don't think it's going to be long. J.J. McCarthy at training camp getting positive notices. Sam Darnold is still Sam Darnold. I, I would almost put it higher if not for the injury risk for McCarthy, but I don't think Darnold's going to last more than two or three weeks. If I had to guess, their schedule is pretty difficult at the beginning. They would love Darnold to do well, but I think J.J. McCarthy is really playing against himself at practice and in the preseason, and so far, so good. I think if he plays well, they're just not going to wait around that long to get to him. Our next question is from Oliver in the UK. He asks, what is the best case scenario for the Colts this season? What's their ceiling, assuming Richardson stays healthy in plays to what you believe his ceiling is this season? I mean, their ceiling's high. 12 wins, 12 and five, like three seed in the AFC. One of those teams that you go into the playoffs thinking like, could the Colts really go to the Super Bowl? And probably won't, but I, I've seen lesser teams in terms of line play make it to the Super Bowl and Richardson ceiling, you know, fantasy wise top five and NFL wise, if he can hit enough big throws, this guy is a great decision maker. He is tier one as athletic, uh, a runner. And in terms of his arm strength uh, of anyone that's ever played in the NFL, he's not going to be that accurate, but if he can just make good decisions like he was making as a rookie, stays healthy, he hits his ceiling. I like the weapons around him. I love the offensive line. I love the defensive line even more. To me, they have as high a ceiling or higher than the Texans. I I do think those are two of the best teams in the AFC, and the Colts should be a little disappointed if they don't make the playoffs. Thanks to Oliver. Let's go to Jack. Jack uh, was determined, and we, we got a lot of these emails. Determined. And why, why do you got to be so determined not to like this show? Like, I get it. I felt the pain of, of around the NFL ending as much more than anyone, obviously. And I did have a little bit of time to kind of grieve and get used to it and understand life sometimes um, gives you things you didn't expect, gives you things you didn't want, and it's how you respond to that. Uh, But you don't need to be rooting against this show and not wanting to like this show. Love this show. Love the new show from Mark and Dan that's going to be coming out. Heed the call. They announced that. And I know that's going to be awesome. And uh, I mentioned that partly because Jack has a heed the call tattoo like myself. Uh, I love it. So I remember uh, the words of Chris Wesley. He he told me that the first time he told me that was, and I'm going to, sound like this is a humble brag actually i was in hawaii and i I was having a little bit of a personal crisis of i can't do the job that i had which was in management anymore i just couldn't do it i had to be happier more fulfilled do something like i ended up doing with around the nfl more full-time and with the network and now what we're doing with nfl daily and that was the first time chris gave me that advice you know he was technically someone who was under me at work, but I always went to him for advice. And that was all about, it's a short life and you got to do what you love and what matters to you. And I, I'm doing it now, even though it's not around the NFL, this podcast is going to mean a lot to me. And I really appreciate everyone who's along for the ride. He does ask a football question. He says, I think Tony Pollard's a brilliant example of a truly explosive, valuable second running back who excelled in that role. But when given the RB1 role with no viable RB2, struggled. So who are your top five RB2s for 2024? Five best RB2s. Well, immediately I think of Tajay Spears and Tony Pollard uh, in Tennessee. Whoever you call the RB2 there, that's two. I love what I'm hearing out of A.J. Dillon that Matt LaFleur says this is the best A.J. Dillon has ever looked. And so whether it's him, whether it's Marshawn Lloyd in Green Bay, I think those are two guys that are going to be absolutely electric as a backup running back. And then, man, I'm going through the the Rolodex right now. Justice Hill, this might be a little high for Justice Hill, but I think Justice Hill is going to have a great season. And I'm going to think of all the RB2s out there that I should have picked for this in like five minutes, and it's going to drive me crazy. And to defend Tony Pollard, I think he struggled because he was coming off a broken leg in the season that they were asking him to do more. He was set up for failure there. He just was not confident in that leg last year, and that's going to be big for Tennessee if he is this year. We'll see. 
Our next question from Andrew. Love the show. Wondering if this could be a segment that would focus on the Panthers possibly being good this season. I know it's unlikely, but could be a way to talk about teams that don't live in the spotlight. Now, I don't know about an entire segment, but I will give you a, a mailbox answer. Defense is more variable every season than offense. I do not like the personnel in Carolina, but there's a reason why Carolina did not let Ajiro Evero, their coordinator, go to Los Angeles where they wanted him to be their coordinators because he's one of the best young defensive coordinators in the league. He has a young group, and even if it's it's hard to see the image, I've seen coaches make young teams like that be average when they didn't have any right to be. So you, you get the average defense there. Bryce Young and Deontay Johnson, I think, are going to be a really good connection. I think they can improve quite a bit. I think of Alex Smith's career arc when I think of where Bryce Young is at right now. One of the worst quarterbacks I've ever seen was Alex Smith as a rookie. Second year, gets a better coordinator. They improved to 7-9. and nine. He was around league average. To me, that that's the recipe for them being good. And, you know, Mingo steps up a little bit and that they're just watchable and that you have a guy that can be a starting quarterback. So not an entire segment, but I gave you like a minute. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, this one's also from a, a different Andrew, a diehard Dolphins fan uh, that has been uh, so accustomed to mediocrity, asked you a bigger question. I wanted to ask me about the Dalton scale. What are entire teams this year that lie on the Dalton line? So for new listeners, the Dalton scale was Chris Wesseling's invention of how to measure whether you have a franchise quarterback or not. If that quarterback is better than Andy Dalton, you have a franchise quarterback. If that quarterback is worse than Andy Dalton, you do not have a franchise quarterback. So I'm here in Oak, in uh, Costa Mesa, rather, with the Vegas Raiders. They do not have a quarterback that's even approaching Andy Dalton back when he was with the Bengals. They are below the Dalton line. Tua Tungavailoa, he's not as high above the Dalton scale line as Dolphins fans think, but he is above it. Entire teams is funny. I thought about this for a while. At first, my thought was the Saints because they're so off the radar. No one really knows what they're going to do. Their entire franchise is just, can we keep our jobs for one more year? They're just trying to get to eight wins, nine wins like they had a year ago so that everyone can stay employed. But I thought about their talent's not even as good as Andy Dalton. They're below the Dalton scale to me of teams, and I, I think they'll finish below that. And I came up with the perfect answer. Come at me, Jags fans. It's the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, you have a quarterback in theory that's like a top 10 quarterback, but it's more in theory, and Trevor doesn't get me excited. Now, he's definitely above uh, the Dalton scale, so that, that makes them a tricky pick here. But as a team, I look at them, and I just don't know what to think. I think, yeah, they're good. They're fine. Their coach is good. Their defense should be okay with, with Ryan Nielsen. Like, they'll be better. The, the weapons around Lawrence... It's pretty good. The offensive line, Anton Harrison, they got some questions, but it's like, it's okay. Like, it's a lot of okay and a quarterback that hasn't been enough better than okay. So the Jags are my pick for the team on the Dalton scale. And uh, finally, last question, it's from Torque, who says he loves the chemistry with Claybon and Jordan. And, yeah, I love it too. We're going to build it up together. We're going to have the regulars in these couple weeks – you might realize are different than the rest of the season's going to be. I'm doing all these training camp tours. A lot of the network people like Steve Weiss and Colleen and Patrick are all over the country. And so it's a little different than when we're going to be in the studio almost every day, but it's been fun going out to the teams. And yeah, Patrick is actually on tomorrow's show drafting uh, some fantasy players. I'm looking forward to that. Torque's question uh, is about the 18 game schedule. What do you think of the timeline and steps getting to the 18 game regular season? Um, I've seen thoughts out there, including two buys, reducing the preseason even further. Yeah, you, you hit it. Uh, there's not even any question. Preseason will go down to two games. They will, I believe, add a week to the season, which now gets us to the day after the Super Bowl being President's Day, which is why I don't think they're going to add another buy. If they did that, then they would have to start a week earlier. I don't think they would want to do that. And... Even though the players, I think, would love that time off, I don't think that's going to happen. If the owners are actually willing to give up some money and pay the players a little higher percentage of total revenue, I think this could happen before the 2131 CBA agreement is up, that they could go to the table and this could happen sooner than later because the players seem open to it. I don't totally love it. I think that's asking a lot for these players 
body. And I think if you're going to do it, you should add that extra buy, even though that's going to give us all an extra week of work, which I don't really want to do. And so that was from Torque. I uh, appreciate, again, all the emails, all the support. Uh, you can send the emails to the NFL Daily Podcast at gmail.com. And that will wrap up today's day down in Costa Mesa with the Raiders. Uh, tell me what team you want to hit next uh, w- when we do some deep dives. We don't want don't to do it too often, uh, but we'll do it uh, every so often. And, yeah, I mentioned Patrick Claibon, Marcus Grant, Mike Florio going to be on our next show drafting the first three rounds of a fantasy draft. We're going to have a lot of fun then. Until then, see you next time.